Uh, hi, everyone. Nice to see everybody here. Uh, this is a wonderful conference. I've been having a great time. Um, just to tell you a little bit about me, uh, I'm CTO at Mimoto. I've been in the software industry for about uh, 24 years or something at this point. I uh, started off in a really obscure programming language at IBM. Uh, since then, I've worked on a wide variety of things and been a part of about five startups in a variety of roles, everything from a consultant to a founder and now CTO. Um, one of the things in getting ready for this, I, I looked up the definition for platform engineering, and this is an excellent definition, very precise, but um, overall, my view on it is just that it's, it's thinking very seriously about your environment that you build for yourself and treating that as a product that you w want to enjoy as you consume it. Um, so, you know, developing internally in your organization should be a pleasure, not, not a burden. So, with that said, I kind of thought it'd be fun to start this off with some gripes. You know, let's talk about some things I don't like or I don't enjoy and haven't enjoyed in my career. And, and the first thing that I don't like is onboarding. So I don't know about you, but if you've been in more than one organization or even if you've only been in one, you've either been onboarded or you've watched other folks get onboarded. And I remember one time I went to a company, it took a week for most people to get an environment set up where they could actually develop. Um, I had, I remember working with that team, we got it down to like, I don't know, 30 minutes or something. So you just did a Git checkout, stood up a Vagrant environment and got running. And that just kind of shifted my whole perspective on what could be possible to really tool up an environment and make it easy to integrate as a new person. Because typically the way the experience is, you show up and you're just looking at a maze, right? And a few po people kind of give you a bit of pointers about which direction to go, but it's kind of up to you to figure out where you want to get to when it should really look like this. Right? Somebody should be helping you step up onto the platform. Another thing I don't like is repetitive labor. Um, now, we all have to do things that, that look similar to what we do day to day, but consistently doing the same thing over and over, um, I think you know, it, it just gets boring, first off. It gets dispiriting. And you start wondering, again, is there something I can do to make this better? I also don't like mysteries. You know, as somebody who's had to support production environments and products that are available in the commercial marketplace, getting those messages where it's kind of, you know, something weird has happened and you have no idea where it came from or what happened, um, having to dig into that, that's a real stressful situation. So really, I don't like stress, but uh, stressful mysteries are the worst. And then there's surprises, you know, uh, the kinds of things that you could have anticipated, but you didn't. Uh, you just didn't take the moment to sit back and think about it. And so instead, you know, the guy that's prone to popping balloons behind you is back there with a paper bag this time. So what's my point? Your internal development platform determines all the things I don't like. And I suspect you don't like them either, right? Onboarding experience is determined by your internal development platform. The repetitive labor you're obligated to. Whether you can avoid the mysteries and whether you can miss the unnecessary surprises. With that said, that means then that it also limits your ability to do what you're there to do. You know, you're getting paid to do a job. You're being kind of rate limited at five kilometers per hour because you can't plan, you can't execute, you can't deliver as quickly as possible because the platform doesn't support it. The flip side is that you can improve it, right? The internal development platform itself can accelerate your ability to deliver. So the good news, I promise everybody in this room, if you're doing software development, you are contributing to your internal development platform. The problem is, are you doing it well? So does this picture say, don't pull, push only, or don't push, pull only? Especially if I'm, you know, maybe colorblind. So I think this all starts with a key question. Did you make it repeatable? Now, I want to be really clear. When I say repeatable, I don't mean an intern giving given four weeks and you know, enough resources and time to go talk to everyone can reproduce what you did five minutes ago. I, I really mean that it is discoverable, right? It's, it's documented. Uh, it's an efficient process. It's extensible, meaning that as new things need to be uh, implemented and it's repeatable, that it's easy and you know, folks can figure out how to contribute, and it's debuggable, right? Is it throwing off information that gives you insight into what is actually going on when the application is running? So first point to the documentation. I kind of talked about you know, discoverable and, and uh, you know, gives you the appropriate information. And here we've got a really great image, right? Somebody goes and they find the documentation finally. They've been searching for it for years. 
finally found it, and it says, we should totally document this. That's just not the experience you want to provide. Another example is, you know, from an efficiency standpoint, sure, it, these 10 steps will totally get you where you want to go, right? Or it'd be much easier to say to someone, just do this one thing, and, it, and it, then you can get working. Now, I showed some anti-patterns a minute ago, but I, I really like the idea of a dongle as an example of extensible. You've got a very clear set of inputs or places where you can plug things in in order to add to your environment. You know, I can just slug the HDMI cable right into my laptop and off and about I go. And finally, debuggable. Now, this image kind of is backwards, right? It's actually saying that, you know, uh, six hours of debugging will save you five minutes of reading documentation, but I think that's the flip side is that five minutes of reading documentation, presuming you can find it and it's available, can save you six hours of debugging. So, repeatable, I, you know, when I kind of put this together, I realized that it spelled deed, and then I, it just felt like I couldn't help myself. It just fit in, right? Platform engineering is performing good deeds, flat out. So, having claimed that repeatability is the key here. How do you make things repeatable? Well, I'll claim that you can start from the bottoms up. And I'm a software developer, so my version of bottoms up is what do I have to do when I'm at the keyboard? So I think it starts with the developer environment. How do you tool that environment to make it easier for someone to get their job done? Well, first thing is kind of document how you do things. Don't don't just do things and then th show people where your code repository is, uh, because that doesn't necessarily give them the, the information that they need. There should be you know, more than just a readme that says, you know, at some point we should probably talk about how you actually stand this thing up. Uh, most environments I've seen are pretty sophisticated in how you actually build the software. Provide tools. Now, this means that when you've got that readme, it doesn't just say, you know, run this make file. It says, run this make file to learn about what's available. Here's something you can do on the first step. The, the key is kind of that mise en place principle, right? Have the tool where you need it, when you need it. Like this beautiful tool board here. Now this image that I'm showing here just kind of shows that idea of um, pluggability, but it also just kind of harkens back to my childhood. I had a Genesis myself. I think this is a Mega Drive, but they had this really crazy tower of power where you'd plug these different things in and you just kept extending the capability of the system until you went from 16 bits to 32 bits with some additional capabilities. Mind blowing at the time. And finally, uh, logging and debugging guides. So it's not, not just about adding the hooks so that people can actually investigate and understand what's going on when they're running your stuff. It's also providing them the travel guide, right? Help them walk through it so they can understand why you put those logging messages there in the first place. Now, as we go forward, I'm gonna get a little repetitive, so I'll just kind of fly through the slides, but um, my claim is that every one of these steps actually lays the foundation for the next one. So if you've automated the development environment, that means you've provided some, some amount of scripting um, in an extensible way that kind of auto makes it so that you can automate things at the workstation. Well, if you've automated it at my laptop, now it's just a small tweak to automate it up in my CI CD system. Oh, one more thing. I've been thinking a lot about platform engineering and its relationship to DevOps, and I've been using the analogy that DevOps was all about kind of building an assembly line, where DevOps is, or where platform engineering is more thinking about the whole factory. You know, how does everyone in the factory interact with your assembly lines? Um, and kind of really thinking about the flow of people and materials. But the principles that underlie automating your build system and your deployment system is the same as it is for automating the development environments. Document it, provide tools, enable extension, and make sure that it's observable. Help people understand and get an x-ray when it's running and so that they know where to start when you're look they're looking for a problem. Now, this image right here for the deployments, this looks like a bunch of containers. Uh, what I love about this picture is it's actually a library. This is the library at NC State University in North Carolina. Uh, you go in, you type the book you want, and a little machine goes off and retrieves the book out of a container and brings it back to you. Uh, or if you're returning it, same thing, right? It puts it into a container, takes it and puts it back. It's kind of like watching a CPU in action. Um, but it really wonderfully illustrates that notion of an automated deployment. You say what you want, it goes off and figures out how to schedule the movement, does it, brings it back to you. And again, same principles. 
So monitoring and reporting, um, I think we've all been in a situation where someone's looking at us, asking what went wrong, and you know, nobody wants to be in a position where the best they've got is probably aliens or something, we're not sure. And again, same principles. So kind of going through that, there's kind of, that's all talking the talk, right? So how, does, how do we walk the walk at Mimoto? And what does that have to do with uh, Open UK and open source? Uh, well, I, my contention would be that, you know, for a small team or for a startup, open source allows you to punch well above your weight. You get to leverage platform engineering from the community at large. So I've got a platform engineering group, you know, numbering in the tens of thousands at this point, if not larger, because I can pull from resources that the community has built. So in order to kind of place that into perspective, I kind of, kind of have to talk about Mimoto a little bit. And so I won't talk about breach detection and response, but I'll talk about our three main components. We have a variety of software agents that run on the server or on a device, um, you know, local on the machine. We have a cloud ML and data science engine that kind of collects data or actually collects data from the agents, also shares data with the agents so they can perform their job. And then finally, we've got a web application for kind of for, that enables customers to manage that and, and see how things are performing, get alerts, configure policy, et cetera. So developing for the, these, this broad array of environments and, and needs for a tiny, a tiny team, you know, we need these tools. Uh, the tools we happen to use, we use JupyterBook, which is a real um, strategic choice. Uh, it enables us not just to maybe, not just to document things and explain things, but we can actually make them interactive. Uh, for example, if we are doing an analysis on data, we can launch a notebook that allows someone else to perform their own analysis on the data and modify the, you know, the breadcrumb that somebody left behind. Uh, it, the next thing, we use Python Invoke to make things efficient. So how do we make it so people can discover how to run a build, how to deploy the agent, uh, new versions of the agent, how to do all the things we do in our day-to-day -day jobs? Invoke gives us a way to kind of provide a catalog. So you can just say, uh, list the tasks, it gives you an idea of it, and you can go and explore and see how those are implemented and how we've automated our environment. That became necessary because of the next tool, actually, Vagrant. Uh, given the wide variety of operating systems that we target with the agents, uh, we want to be able to make it so you can just say, you know, stand up an environment for this target operating system that we support. But there's a limitation on the Mac with libvirt. Uh, I ran into this is something like 24, or I think by default it's 12, Mac's virtual machines within a Vagrant file. So we had to break it up. If you have to break it up, well, now you've got to figure out a way to make it easy for people to navigate. I could document that there are, you know, we, there's a way to do this where you specify the Vagrant file on the command line, et cetera, or I could make it really, really simple so that all I say is task, vagrant up, operating system. So that's what we've done. Uh, in addition to vagrant, we have Docker. We use that for a variety of things, everything from uh, deploying a web environment to uh, setting up a build environment from when we're targeting a particular operating system. And then PyTest. Uh, on the debugability side, I'll say I think unit tests um, or other tests, whatever you want to call them, integration tests, these are key in you know, documenting what's the expected behavior and giving people a place where they can go find, you know, when something breaks, they've got a starting point to understand what's going wrong and it becomes a repository. When things break, write a test to make sure that it doesn't break again. Now on the CI, CD side, it's all those tools. So you know, kind of reinforcing what I said earlier, which is that if you automate the development environment, you set the stage for CI, CD because all of that work we do in uh, Invoke becomes the basis for what we're gonna do in CI, CD using GitHub Actions. Uh, currently, we don't use Terraform, but that's in the roadmap. And I think I'll say right now, my hope is to get to something like Cradix. And on the monitoring, monitoring and reporting side, today we just you know, take advantage of what our cloud provider offers us. Uh, longer term, that's not gonna be sufficient. Uh, it's sufficient for today, small team getting started. Uh, we're looking at something like open telemetry when we're ready to take on more of that observability uh, on, on our own. So what is platform engineering or what's the key thing? Make it repeatable. Do it from the bottom up, do it with open source tools and the consistent application of good deeds. Thank you.
It's for David. Somebody, go on, have a question. I did prep a little demo. So if, if folks would like to see, I don't know, I, I talked about Python Invoke. Something very, very simple. Um, Uh, is that, oh, yep, we can make that bigger. So very small set of things, but the, the key thing is that we've got some things that we have to do on a regular basis, uh, just automating that. So very simple Python scripts, you just list out the things that are possible. Now this isn't everything, uh, this is within one project. One of the next things we're doing is actually trying to make it so that um, across the different repositories that we've got. We'll have a kind of master repository that you run the, the tasks from that repository and it'll allow you to explore what tasks are available elsewhere. Uh, that way, any given repository can advertise, you know, get set up uh, with the cloning, et cetera, and so all you have to do for discoverability is just check out one thing and then start asking it, interrogating it, what can we do? And, and then go from there. Very simple demo. I'd show you the code, but. Any other questions? I wonder if you could um, just give us a few sentences on the why. I oh. mean, I think it's sort of yeah. embedded in your talk, but yeah. So the, the, for me, the key thing, the, the key why behind platform engineering is um, making the development within your organization as smooth as possible. So from in, you know, coming up with the idea through deploying it into production, uh, making that process simple, straightforward, uh, pleasant, and repeatable. I, I think a key thing is making it repeatable again. That, that it, without the repeatability, um, you're, you're dooming yourself to a lot of pain and a lot of uh, repetitive suffering. Okay. Oh, I have my question. So um, you're a, a small growing startup and when you look at DevOps S3 and, and the CI CD pipeline, usually if you look at big companies, then you can say, oh yeah, they have, have the team to actually invest the time and effort. But as a small company, you have to think about where do I allocate the resources and what's the priority for me. And you can say, yes, this is a good investment, but it takes time and maybe I should focus on uh, maybe on sales or building the product itself or, or customer support. So it's much more difficult to actually have an established DevOps and maybe your pipeline, your processes change within a short period. So what, what were the main challenges for you in terms of implementing a solution or what do you think is, is blocking the implementation if there is something like that? We'll talk about Mimoto first. I, I think at Mimoto, I've got the benefit of, of kind of making the, the benefit, uh, risk, the cost benefit trade off decision to some extent. You know, it is a team discussion, um, but we've got the ability to move fast and, and choose. We, we are resource constrained, um, but as I mentioned in the talk, I think the, the key thing is that there are a whole bunch of tools that people are out there developing. And so taking a few minutes to go and see has someone solved this problem that I'm having? You know, is there a tool that can make it so, for example, I don't want people to have to think about configuring libvert on Mac OS in order to get our stuff running. I want them to be able to get running as quickly as possible. Um, thinking about that and doing some research and realizing, well, there's this thing that, that we're already using and testing because we need to interact with uh, SSH shells. So Invoke was actually a part of a, a PyTest setup that, that we put together. Um, and then realizing that that combined with, uh, with Vagrant could make it so that we could just arbitrarily construct the command lines. Uh, it took a little bit of just poking around the web and asking different questions with variations on here's the environment to both have the seeds of the idea and see where other people had already uh, had a similar problem and solved it by having these kind of uh, top high level configuration scripts. Um, within a larger organization, because I've also been in the larger organization, I think what you have to do is kind of talk about, when you're talking with the executive team or the sponsor or whatever, you know, what is the situation? How much time is being wasted trying to, uh, having people figure things out repetitively because they're, they're all figuring out the same things. 
and how much time is being wasted just um, everyone reinventing a part of the wheel uh, within the organization. If you can make that case for here's the situation, here's what I recommend, and then provide any additional information that would help clarify that, I, I've seen that work pretty well. Um, it's re just really giving folks the information they need to do the cost benefit analysis. And, and following up on that, when you, you actually also need to invest time and research the tools that you are going to apply and how, how much burden, if, if that is a burden, is that a burden uh, itself? Because even maybe the tool exists, you need to source it, even if it's free or open source and, and research it. I'll say within different organizations, I know the cost of uh, adopting a new open source technology can vary pretty wildly. Uh, it, I've been, there has been a pretty big shift in the uh, industry toward open source program offices that can help teams with adoption of open source products within their organization. Uh, I think a, a decent rule of thumb that I saw on someone's blog post, I, I wish I could name it here today, was um, they look at in that reinvesting about 10% into refactoring and uh, other kind of uh, you know, supporting their own consumption of their own product uh, internally. And it, I think as a way of thinking about that, that seems like a pretty reasonable thing, about a 10% investment, or at least come up with your own number for what the organization thinks it can bear. Um, and then try to keep track of it so you can justify that investment later on and show that it, just like any investment, it should compound, right? The, the benefit should vastly outweigh long-term what you put in in the short term. Thank you.